Hi guys, welcome to Africa's Talking Podcast. Uh, Africa's Talking powers conversations across Africa. We power the communication between businesses, governments, and organizations of all sizes and their customers and citizens on our SMS, USSD, airtime, and voice gateways and APIs. Africa's Talking also supports GDPR, data compliant communication, on our future-ready customer data platform, Illyrian. Today we talk to Dr. Weche and Teddy Warrior. We look forward to an interesting conversation today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Welcome our viewers. Uh, this is uh, Michael Kemadi, or you can call me MK, for the Impact Masters podcasts. We are blessed to have in the house one and only Revelled Dr. Weche. And accompanied by one and only Ted Warrior, a familiar guest in our podcasts. And it's always a bliss, it's always a blessing to the young people and upcoming tech gurus and designers across Africa to listen to this beautiful mind that has created opportunities across the continent. Thank you so much. How are you guys today? Ah, that's uh, that's awesome to hear. So please go ahead and uh, introduce yourself uh, before we go on uh, with the conversations uh, for today. Please. Thank you. I'm Teddy uh, Warrior. I'm uh, part of Africa Stalking uh, since the beginning. And uh, I'm also part of ACAD as a mentor. I enjoy mentoring the next generation of African leaders. And if you're to press me hard, I'd say I like growing leaders and uh, raising African entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you so much, Teddy. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, I think maybe let me speak a bit about uh, Dr. Weche himself, a PhD holder, is uh, a man of God. Uh, he has done amazing stuff in a really short time. Since 1984 uh, through 2015, uh, from what I'm looking at, uh, he has been so many things. Number one, 1984 to 1989, uh, he studied theology and biblical, uh, biblical doctrine at the Nairobi Bible Training Institute, or if you like, NBTI. Yeah. Uh, 1985 to 1989, he was at the University of Nairobi, doing Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine uh, a degree, BVM, if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, 1999, uh, he was able to do uh, Demelin Management School, that's Botswana, uh, Diploma in Accounting, yeah. Chief. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is good, this is good. Uh, 2001, he, did, uh, he joined the Institute of Commercial Management in UK, uh, diploma business management and administration. Mm -hmm. uh, 2001 again, uh, same uh, same year. Uh, Australia University, Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Computer networking. Uh, <laughs> same year again. <laughs> same same university. Financial management graduate uh, studies. Uh, 2002 2005, he did uh, the uh, the Montfort the Montfort uh, University Mont in UK. Uh, master's in uh, business administration, uh, that is a B, uh, MBA. Uh, then uh, January to December 2009, uh, Nairobi International School of Theology, Kenya. You went back to God a little bit. <laughs> master's in governance studies. Uh, well, not theology though. <laughs> uh, then uh, in April, May 2010, uh, Metropolitan uh, Mediation uh, Services, uh, Boston, USA, certificate in mediation, uh, and it didn't stop. Uh, so February to May 2010, Harvard uh, Law School, he did program in negotiation. Nice. Uh, January to May, again in 2010, University of Massachusetts, uh, Boston, uh, he did uh, dispute resolution, uh, graduate studies. Uh, January again <laughs> to May 2010, University of Massachusetts, uh, he did entrepreneurship, uh, graduate studies. In September 2015, uh, to date, he has been, uh, he has been uh, at the Management University of Africa as a PhD candidate. So you can call him a prof or a doc uh, in, in the waiting. In the right? US, you're a prof. I don't know if uh, uh, prof. Yes, 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 yes. Chief, ah, it looks, if you look at, you know, the, you know, the education side of things, um, it has, 
metaphor uh, you have started with animals yes. and you you have, you have gone to uh, you know take a little bit and then you have come to like uh, you know people resolving issues mm-hmm. you know how do you carry out negotiation i would like to hear from you what because some of us just do an undergrad and you know we are good uh, and then maybe we go and do an mb after 10 years uh, and then maybe after that you feel like ah, unless i want to be a lecturer <laughs> or a, a professor somewhere then i go back to school so yeah. what advice is this journey because it's quite kind of interesting yeah Well, the journey first of all is advised by um, <clears throat> a lot of curiosity. Yep. Mm. Uh, not being satisfied with just the, the information that we're kind of thrown at. Mm-hmm. Dick and Harry. So, mm-hmm. for example, as a born again Christian, I had challenges with some of the answers that I received from either the pulpit when I sat in the, <laughs> or the Christian Union. And you know, when you ask hard questions, yes. questions yeah. you start getting upset. Yeah. So, the easier thing to do is just go and do theology studies. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, at least you will know, find some of these guys that mm-hmm. answers. Mm. And when you ask your professors, you know, hard questions, yeah. mm. they don't have problem with it. Yeah. yeah. And as you move on in life and as you grow, your experiences uh, also change. So, yeah. Uh, going from veterinary medicine, for example, and finding myself needing to know stuff about accounting, which I didn't know. Yeah. Business administration and then financial management. And yeah. Computers exploded out there and I knew that. Ah. I see. And then thereafter, you know, getting myself into a situation where uh, as I now became politically active, I realized they hey, mm-hmm. don't know much about governance. <laughs> so go back into graduate studies on governance at, uh, you know, the yep. International School of Theology. Uh, and then from there now, you realize, you know, just governance is actually leadership. Mm-hmm. But before you get into the leadership, we had like, post-election violence and people thought I had answers to that and I didn't have serious answers. Mm-hmm. So Interesting. I went there, yeah, well, so I went and said, resolution in mm-hmm. Boston. And while I was there, the professors are the ones who shoved us now into Harvard Law School to do the program on negotiation. So wow. sometimes you go into one place and then other doors open. Mm. And then thereafter. The land of opportunity. Yeah. So, so to speak. And while you are there, you start to realize, but wait a minute, there's a, a fine line between just negotiation and there's mediation and there's arbitration. Mm. And you have to study all of those mm-hmm. separate. You know, mm-hmm. so I, that's why I have those other extra things that I studied. And then nice. I come back now to Kenya now got to more involved with the political uh, leadership mm. and i realized i really don't know much about leadership per se yes yes hence go back <laughs> yeah that's so, that's 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 something because it, it sounds like uh, most of what you did was more of an there's a need yeah. right and I, i like it because um sometimes we 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 ignore most of the problems because we feel like we're not well equipped we're not educated enough to to face them but for you you're like you know people are fighting in a uh, 207 or there is uh, you know dispute resolution that is needed and, and then you go back to school yeah. you come back and you are well prepared that's that's interesting i think mm. uh, you, you think you're well prepared until yeah. you meet Mata uh, what's oh. up <laughs> <laughs> you meet at Harvard law school uh, oh okay yeah, is, yeah, how utajua how you yeah. serious huh? yeah, kind yeah. of situation yeah, eh yeah, you go back and study some more <laughs> so, 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 Julius, could you help us uh, understand maybe your first encounter with her there and maybe the questions yeah. she asked you or what you asked her so that our viewers can uh, can understand why you saying that she's always prepared yeah Well, I, I, as, a, as a Kenyan resident in Boston, mm. we were invited to attend a talk that she was having at Harvard Law School. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, as every other Kenyan uh, who is there was asking, why would you want to go and listen to this talk? So Wanja, who we mentioned, Ashoka Lago, was very persistent. She called me up to three times a day, you know, make, you know, make sure you come. And I'm wondering, why should I come? But anyway, since she was on my neck, yeah. uh, you know, I, I humbly accepted and I went and I sat into that particular conversation. Mm-hmm. And as she spoke, I felt I had issues with uh, some of her answers. Mm-hmm. I uh, took down notes, okay. questions. I mm-hmm. had about 10 questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then after the talk, uh, I went and met her face to face and I asked her the mm-hmm. 10 questions mm-hmm. one by one. Mm-hmm. Nice. So can hora to me. Yeah. She replied to all 10 without referring to any written material. Yeah. Looking at me in the eye. Yeah. And she basically hit me 10 nails. Ah, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Honestly, yes. I was so embarrassed to ask yeah. anyone. She says, "Now it's my turn to ask you." Mm. 
Mm-hmm. When I even bring those skills to Kenya, so that you can add value to the Kenyan people. Mm. And of course, I had no intention of doing that at that point. Ah, most people in the uh, uh, diaspora, you have to sweet talk them better than just <laughs> please come back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, please bring yes. your yeah. mic clo- yeah. yeah, so yeah. She, she threw me that challenge and I said, okay, when I come back to Kenya, I shall follow you up. Mm-hmm. Mm. My shock and horror, she actually called me back. And mm. that's wow. how I got introduced to the political party. Mm. NAC Kenya. NAC Kenya. Mm-hmm. Mm. I got involved in the leadership and had to, you know, take my blows in rising and uh, going to the grassroots and communicating to people what our policies and all that were. Mm. Eventually rising to national level. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So so I I think we have jumped the gun here up to Mother Karua, but it's fine. It's okay. We are good. Uh I, I just wanted to know how is it working with animals? Do you like get to uh be a veterinary or yes, I, I did qualify mm. for Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine. Mm-hmm. Um we were the first glot not to be employed by government, which mm-hmm. was a bit of a challenge. Oh yeah. Uh wait. Uh, yes. How tell me about uh, tell us a bit about that. I, I think our government officials had the misappropriation. It was the end of Previously, you would have just jumped into the government. Normally, as soon as you finish your exams in uh, June, mm. from 1st July, you're on government payroll. Mm. Oh. So you were the first people who, as soon as... Uh, Which, whose government was that? Kenya government. Who's, yeah. who's, who was the president then? The president was Moya. Moya, yeah. Huh? Yes, but it was, it's a governmental thing that really doesn't matter as to who is in charge. Yes, yes, yes. It's mm-hmm. just how it used to be. Yeah. That uh, the, the, those who are qualified are automatically absorbed and, you know, to the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm-hmm. Sent to various parts of the country mm-hmm. where they're going to be able to add value. So we were the first lot not to be uh, absorbed, which was shocking to us. Ah, so, eighty five in the eighties, late eighties. This was nineteen eighty nine. Maybe because of the structural adjustment programs from World Bank. You guys had just eaten money. To cut mm-hmm. Ah, okay. <laughs> because eventually people were employed a year later. Okay, ah, okay. but by the time they were employed, with all due respect, I had had some mentors come into my life. Mm. They had opened doors for me which I didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. I was already earning three times. Mm. Driving or mm. in hey. wearing suits. There was no way I was going to start going to the bush. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, back to this question. I mean, did you just abandon? Mm. I didn't abandon it per se because when I uh, went to work in Botswana, mm. uh, the opportunity there was to get into the livestock uh, industry. Mm-hmm. And I opened up a, a supplies company, a veterinary mm-hmm. supplies company, which mm-hmm. became the largest supplier of veterinary products in Botswana government in excess of 10 years. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that's interesting. That was that was pretty nice. It was very exciting, and it's in in the process of running that business that I discovered. Oops, uh, <laughs> you don't know much about business here. You don't know mm. much about accounting. So that's why I also then had to go back and do accounting, go back and do diploma of business administration, mm. go back and do an MBA degree. You know, go back and struggle, struggle with financial management because it reaches a point of running a business where you're not just uh, selling bricks. Mm. Uh, it's not just A minus B is equal to C. You know? Yeah. Sales must have minus cost to profit. You now yeah. have to be able to process, uh, you know, some of the things that mm. you have to do. You have to have capital for the business. You have to be able to expand the business. Mm. You have to invest, uh, you know, long term. Yeah. And things like that. So, for example, uh, learning what uh, research and development is all about. Yeah. Put fifteen percent aside for R and D, which for a lot of people thought it was just me going and enjoying myself in Singapore and uh, other exotic places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I yeah. did enjoy myself out there. <laughs> <laughs> a man has to enjoy himself. A man has to enjoy himself because you do R&D. Yeah. Yeah. Without R&D, you're, you're half dead in your business. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, you, you may want to talk more about this Botswana gig. How did you get there before even... Because that's like a, a, it's like a random event, it looks like, but maybe not. It was not too random. Uh, mm-hmm. I went to visit a particular gentleman. Okay, yeah. in Botswana. No, in Kenya. Here. In Kenya. Mm-hmm. I went to visit this fellow, and uh, like every other Kenyan, it was at that point when we didn't have employment. When yes. Employed by government. Even right now, right? It's like mm. we are back to the same yeah. situation. Because yeah. so, actually, if, you, if, you, if someone takes what you're saying mm-hmm. into their context today, it may be very, very much help. Yeah, okay. okay. So, mm-hmm. so I went and saw this gentleman, mm-hmm. and like every other Kenyan, I was looking for a handout. Mm-hmm. That was my mentality. Yeah. And this was 1980s. This is 1989. So the world just goes around and history repeats itself. It does. So you need to learn from history. So mm-hmm. you become a statistic. Mm. But uh, in my wanting to get a handout, this guy did a SWOT analysis on me. 
Mm-hmm. Never had a SWOT analysis done on me. Mm-hmm. No clue what a SWOT analysis was. Mm-hmm. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your opportunities? What are your threats? And what is your way forward? Mm-hmm. So I felt really embarrassed in that 30-minute uh, interview. Yeah. And at the end of it, he felt that uh, some of my strengths uh, basically existed in my offering, my professional services outside the country. Mm-hmm. And he proposed I go to Botswana. Yeah. So wow. When I left that meeting, I thought, this is Total idiot. How can you just this? <laughs> Come for a handout and you're busy doing a SWOT analysis on me. Yeah. yeah. So that explains why a number of our mentees also feel the same way. Mm. Mm. Yeah. SWOT analysis so questions. That, yes, mm. SWOT analysis questions because they just want handouts because that's our mentality. Right? But to cut a long story short, uh, two years later when I could have been doing as best as I thought I could be because mm. of driving and all that, I felt like I'd hit a glass ceiling. And mm-hmm. So you didn't even go to Botswana immediately? Not immediately. You told mm-hmm. that guy, ah, you are telling me stories. Let yeah, me go. Wasting, wasting my time. I mm-hmm. walked away. So, but it's two years later that that thing hit me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When now I'd reached the glass ceiling on where I was, mm-hmm. and I started recalling some of the advice that you've given. And that's when I started strategically preparing to go there. So I first went to Botswana with a friend of mine on holiday. Mm-hmm. So I went on holiday, and then from there went to South Africa because we were feeling young and Hot blood. And, mm. and this is 90s, right? This is now 92. 92, mm. yeah. 1992. Ah. We enjoyed ourselves. We made mm. some foolish decisions. We know went to dangerous places like, like <laughs> Alexandria. <laughs> Alexandra, I'm waiting for you to say that. We did South know, Africa. Yeah. We, we didn't know what townships were. Yeah. Yeah. There was no information on South Africa those days. Yeah. yeah. We were riding on the trains. You know, those days trains were either a C O I F E. Yes. Mm. It's, it's a miracle we didn't get thrown off those trains. Serious. Yeah, because yeah. appetite was active, they had not gained any. There was still appetite, impaired. by the way. There was still yeah. appetite because that's actually yeah. something that's this is another yeah. context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there was a lot of black on black violence. Yeah. And mm. We as Kenyans still there. Yeah. Know that. Mm. We did not know it's that. still there, by the mm. way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, they, they call it xenoph- xenophobia. Xenophobia. Yeah, xenophobia. Mm. We didn't know that. But mm-hmm. we we learned very quickly. Oh. Foolishness. But to cut a long story short, we mm. then I was then able now to meet various uh, persons. Mm. I presented my ideas to. Mm. And they took me on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, one particular one bothered me every single day for the entire time I was there saying that we could get into a particular supplies business. I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And so when I took the risk of uh, trusting this guy, that's mm. when I started my first company, uh, Leroux Services. Mm. Uh, in, Botswana. in Botswana. And uh, what does Leroux mean? Leroux actually means animals. Okay. Mm. Animals services. Mm. So people now go to Lorua was a local, it's a local name. Word. It's a Setswana word. Okay. Yeah. So in Setswana, King Anka word, what is Lerua? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor of animals. Ah, mm. interesting. Yes. Okay, okay. Sorry, I said that in Setswana. <laughs> no, no, that's worries, perfect. No worries, this is for half. This is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so uh, yeah. there's something actually I, I need to ask uh, at this point. I see you're a bit spiritual, right? A bit. Please talk about that. Yes, Why is please. it important to be spiritual? Uh, how, do, how can you say somebody who's a reverend is a bit spiritual? What's the mm. definition of... Uh, now no, it's, 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 no, it's after, it's after going to some, it's after going to some uh, you know, religious event. Let, let, like, ah, let, let me tell you why. This pastor is really, really, really. <laughs> <laughs> A doctor, reverend. Yes. So yes. the reason I've said that is that if you look at the uh, the young guys, you see from 2000 to right now is yeah. someone who was born in 2000. Yes. They are already 22 years old. Yes. Making a lot of uh, decisions around spiritu- uh, spirituality. Yeah. Uh, and with the, with the current state of affairs when it comes to churches, which are the champions of spirituality, mm. uh, they are more focused on religion than spirituality. Mm. So I would like to understand, is what, what's your take on that, given that you have done this for some time now, and mm. what key part has it played in your life until today? Well, what I would summarize that, God is calling us to faith in him. Mm-hmm. That's number one. And then faith is mm-hmm. actually revealed in the written word. Mm-hmm. That is the Bible. Mm-hmm. But for those who don't have access to, to the written word, mm-hmm. there's the heavens above you, there's the stars, there's the, there's the sky, there's the sun, there's the moon. Mm-hmm. That's why the Bible says the, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. And the mm-hmm. Bible actually declares his handiwork. You know, mm-hmm. Day by day, pause for speech. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the question is, are we listening? Mm-hmm. Night by night declares knowledge. Yeah. So you can come to faith in God just by looking at the creation mm. and realizing there's a creator. Mm. But a lot of people, you know, are so busy with whatever it is they're doing, they mm. can't actually look up and see that they're actually stars yeah. and appreciate that there are actually billions of stars out there. Mm. Yeah. So at least science has helped us understand uh, the heavens a little bit better. 
Yeah. 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 But over and above that now as you expose yourself to religious uh, writings and mm. where theology comes in, mm. you need to be in a position where you can compare mm. what does the Christian faith allegedly say mm. vis-a-vis the Muslim faith, the Buddhists, the, mm. you know, the Baha'is, uh, the Hindus and the rest. Mm. Mm. And then hopefully make a decision based mm. on, you know, that information mm. as to what you feel you want to base your, your faith on. Yeah. Mm. So a lot of people want to base their faith on hyper uh, hyperbole and uh, hype and uh, you know all sorts of secular you know, yeah, stuff, secular yeah. things a lot of people are prosperity gospel type of people yeah you know uh, give and then it shall be given to you that's what mm. the bible so yeah you, you uh, use it yeah mm. use that. so you can say you are like a you are like a you are a pastor who actually put work mm. yes. you don't believe in miracles mm. per se you do but you realize that wealth is created wealth actually is created i've just come from Accra, Ghana. Mm. And I was very sad that all of in Accra Ghana at the apartment that we stayed, it was surrounded by six churches. Oh, are you sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> and as I made noise on Facebook, some of my usual critics came up and said, ah, you escaped where you were living because there was a mosque. Okay, then I went to a place where now there's a very noisy church. And yeah, I don't so want cause... to name it so that some people <laughs> don't take offense. And then now that you have gone to Ghana and the same thing has followed me. Yeah. So we are investing in alleged spirituality. Mm. Alleged spirituality. Yes. Hey, yeah. And okay. In fact, the pastor and a few guys are the ones who are, who are getting rich. Mm. That's the true. Rest of you are being ripped off in daylight. Mm. That's true. Mm. So, 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 that's so, true. So, Dr. Julius, yeah. uh, why don't you watch it, Dr. Machu, why don't you speak a bit about the principle of uh, of hard work and uh, uh, according to Christianity mm. and how even from the beginning of Abraham. Mm. Yes. Uh, he was in a desert and what have you, but he still made something. Became out. wealthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, yeah. could you engage us on this thing? Because I've seen a lot of pastors who have uh, V8s and all mm. this kind of thing. And yes. They are, they, are, they are parishioners or members walk to church or take a bus. And so, what kind of uh, Christianity is that? And how can you help Christians or everyday Kenyan or, Af- or Africans? Mm. Distinguish between a true uh, representative of God, as it were, uh, and a false one. Because I yeah. think uh, the world needs to a little bit of fresh air. <laughs> yes, mm. <laughs> well, well, the Bible does say in the book of John that you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Mm. Yeah. So the first question you need to ask yourself is that are you exposing yourself to the truth? Okay. A lot of us are exposing ourselves to lies. Mm. Now, secondly, a lot of us expose ourselves to lies because, as the Bible says, we shall uh, get people around us mm. who will say things that tickle our ears. Mm-hmm. So a lot of us like to be deceived. Mm-hmm. And now that it's like a natural uh, inclination. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry to say now that we're coming out of an electioneering period, you can yeah. see the example of our politicians mm-hmm. who have deceived us like there's no tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And now they have the opportunity of putting some of those things into practice. Mm. So we like to be deceived. So mm. we like to be no, if you just uh, sprinkle this holy water on you, all those problems will go. But guess what? Uh, you just need to bring in a thousand shillings or you know, fifty dollars or <laughs> so many rands, yeah. and all that is going to do. So that's what we like to hear. Yeah, but we do not understand Galatians six nine to ten that says, "Do not be deceived; mm. God will not be mocked. Mm-hmm. What a person sows, that they shall reap." Mm-hmm. Yeah? So mm-hmm. you need to bear in mind: okay? he who mm. sows sparingly will reap sparingly, mm. and who sows Mm, so we think we can mock God. Mm. We're not investing and sowing in our academics. Yeah. We're not investing and sowing in our businesses. Mm. We're yeah. not investing and sowing in our relationships. Yeah. All we're doing is going to some of these churches, like one of the churches around the apartment where I was. Mm. They started their service at 11 p.m. with loud banging of drums. This is oh. Accra Gala. <laughs> <laughs> and it went on until Oh, I was, hoping, I was hoping you'd say something uh, that you enjoyed the food and everything. Uh, but it's, I did. Things were tough. It was hot. <laughs> it was hot. My, my throat was constantly on fire. Uh, yeah. But but now that's an example of sowing and reaping. What are you sowing by going to church at 11 p.m.? Yes, true. Mm, true. True. 5 a.m. True. 6 a.m. Mm. And that's just one of the churches. Mm. They almost had a 24-hour cycle. Yeah. Then you look around and there are no industries. Mm. Yeah. Everybody is basically buying and selling. 
consumption economy. Consumption economy. Mm. And the Ghanaian CD was really hammered. Mm. Uh, their economy was really hammered. Just last quarter, it mm. dropped. The CD they was couldn't even pay their their debts. I think the CD was about six to the US dollar mm. at the beginning of this year. It's mm. now at ten. Mm. Mm. So you almost forty percent loss. Yes, in one year. In six months. Oh, yeah, in six yeah. months. But I'm just saying within that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But my point is. The people are busy doing what? Going to these services, receiving themselves at a little bit of sprinkled water and some of these things are automatically going to change or whatever. Mm. You are not working in terms of actually doing work that is going to result in, you know, like a farmer. So Creation of wealth. And then reaping. Yeah. yeah. So my colleagues that I went with, and they can attest to me, went out one day wanting to buy vegetables. They couldn't get vegetables. Skuma, cabbage, nini, hakuna. Mm. Hakuna. Nobody is growing those things. Mm. Yet there's a demand. There's a demand for those things. And there's land, okay? And in the area where we stayed, with all due respect, and I'm not putting down the, the citizens of the country, yeah. it was like a construction zone because half the place had mansions that were being built, but they are half built. So everybody in that particular area has to build a mansion. Mm. Wow. such a think, pressure to build mansions. Yeah, I think wow. uh, uh, most Canadians, mm. uh, they believe that uh, one of the best ways of investing Mm. In building houses or mansions for rent. Mm. Or, ah, okay. So it's, it's it's their thing. It's mm. like also almost in Kenya here, where people once they get a little money, the first thing they think about is buying an acre. Mm. Like exactly. An acre mm. of acre of Boroti land. maguta maguta. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On it, uh, yeah. beacon to beacon. Mm. Yeah. So that's what uh, majority of my Ghanaian friends that I know. Mm. Yeah. That's what they 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 pursue. With mm. you know, they Mm. Yeah, and, and and even even Odemaya, mm. so we know Odemaya, yeah. yeah, yeah. So even one of the first things they did was to build a palatial mm. uh, mansion mm. after making proceeds from his uh, YouTube, channel. yeah, channel mm. Odemaya, which basically means I love my mother. Mm. Mm. Okay. You know, I like this idea you're talking about, uh, and thank you for raising it. Mm. Every village in Africa, there is either a mosque, a church. Mm. Or a school. Mm. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, because you've done governance. Mm. How can we uh, harness the things we have? Like just the church, the mosque, uh, the schools, mm. as drivers of positive behavior for creation of wealth. Mm. Because if I was to develop Africa, by the way, my money would go to that level where I would say, which school can I partner with? Because the communities respect schools. They respect churches. They respect mosques. Mm. So, like, as also as a reverend, what, what, how have you seen any initiatives to create wealth at that level? And is it feasible to say that creating wealth in Africa could be driven by an objective religious setup at the grassroots? The answer is yes. Mm. The challenge is that the leaders in those places don't understand what you've just said. Mm. And therefore, they are always going to be out there looking. Mm. So pastors and leaders in some of those rural areas are only interested in squeezing as much tithe out mm. of the people. Yeah. Uh, always creating programs where they can get as much money out of the people. Yeah. They're not going to be interested in sharing details of entrepreneurship and building wealth and what have you. Mm. The schools are focused on only one thing. And that's the curriculum and getting top grades. Mm. Details of how you're going to start offering entrepreneurship courses, mentor mentoring them and all that. They don't want. In fact, they feel that it's an, uh, an infringement onto their reading time and the rest. So mm. most of those schools have no time for us at all. They're not interested in what we have to say. Mm. Yeah. So the schools focus on their curriculum. The churches are focused on getting the you know the tithe. Mm. I will not speak for the mosques because uh, it's a while since I've been to a mosque. So yeah. mm. I don't want any of my Muslim friends to feel a bit insulted by that. Yeah. Mm. But that is the reality that is on the ground. So yeah. as much as you have this knowledge and that information available, and those pulpits and schools are the places where you need to expose them. Mm. That is not happening. Yeah. It's probably not going to happen for quite a while. Mm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, um, if you look at African context, uh, mm. the biggest problem uh, is corruption and poverty, and, and one leads to the other. Mm. And, and when I was trying to personally, like, impact change, I realized actually the change can only be done through mindset change. And one of those things that actually these leaders you're talking about, they don't want people to be exposed to uh, a better mindset. Like if I get money, even here in Kenya, I think it, it's it, it's quite uh, like obvious. Most guys are like, if you get money, there are like three, four, five 
path. Number one is maybe get married. Mm-hmm. Number two, get yourself a plot. If you're able, maybe build something. If you're not able to 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 build, just get a plot or a shamba and you know let it appreciate and let it appreciate. Mm. But also. you and I know if you do the math, to some extent, you know that's not an investment, right? Mm.